All right, well, this evening we're going, as I've already told you, look at the, uh, the next account that is in um, Luke's gospel that Luke gives to us in the life and ministry of Jesus where he goes to the city of Nain. Uh, that's basically seven verses um, in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. <clears throat> this is what Luke, by uh, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes to us. Soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped them all and they began glorifying God saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. This report concerning him went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding district. Well, again, may the Lord uh, grant his mercy and his grace as we um, uh, hear what he has to tell us in this particular text this evening. Now, this morning, remember we saw the importance of faith the centurion believed that Jesus could heal his servant by just speaking the word because he believed that Jesus had authority over sickness and he wasn't disappointed. Jesus spoke and his servant was healed. But the point is, the servant wouldn't have been healed if the centurion had not believed and laid hold of the promises of the Lord in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is important, we saw, because faith is what allows us to uh, receive from the Lord. It allows us to receive salvation, to take hold of the Lord Jesus Christ. Basically, the Bible tells us that faith is what unites us to Jesus. It creates a legal union. Actually, um, uh, we, we receive a living union through the power of the Holy Spirit as He unites us to Jesus and makes us alive. But once he makes us alive, we trust in Jesus, there's a legal union between us and Jesus so that everything that he did in his life, all of his obedience, is given to us. It becomes ours. It's credited to our account. And our sins are taken away by his payment on the cross. And then being righteous in God's eyes, he declares us to be just. And that is what allows us to enter into heaven. Faith is important for our salvation. We need to trust in Jesus. But faith is also important because it's the only way that we receive anything from God. We have to believe that he is faithful, that he is trustworthy, that he's going to honor his word, that he will do what he says. And as we look to him in faith, he will give us, as our Lord reminded us, all that we ask of him according to his word. Now this evening, um, we're going to use this particular event, this particular miracle to look behind the scenes, as it were, to what it is that, that basically has to happen in us before we can have faith, this kind of faith, this saving faith. And as I've already told you, we must be raised from spiritual death to spiritual life. We don't come into the world with this kind of faith. It's not something that everybody can exercise. It's something that is a gift from God that he sovereignly gives, and he gives it through his son, the Lord Jesus. Well, Luke goes on to tell us now that after healing the centurion servant, that Jesus went to a city called Nain. It's about 25 miles southwest of Capernaum. Now, Nain, um, we would assume from the meaning of its name, must have been a nice place uh, to, to live and perhaps you might say a nice place to visit as well, because the name means lovely. It means green pastures. And you can imagine how welcome that would be to an agrarian uh, society, to people in a place like that, because agriculture was very important. Well, he was traveling with his disciples, and besides his disciples, there was a large crowd following him uh, when Jesus went around ministering, particularly during the time of his popularity, it tended to draw a crowd. 
the Father was making sure that there were plenty of people who were there to witness what it is that Jesus was doing, and on this occasion, what he was about to do. As he came near the city gates, he ran into a funeral procession. A dead man was being carried out, uh, followed by his, his mother. Now, Luke tells us that this woman was a widow. She had already lost her husband, which means she had lost her primary means of support. And now that she was bereft of her only, uh, really the only other person uh, who could have cared for her in those days, her son, um, well, she was in some dire straits. I think we should assume that unlike Naomi, remember Naomi who left with her husband and her two sons and uh, went out of the land because of the famine in that land, and that's of course where we read about the story of Ruth, uh, how she went out with, with, again, her husband and two sons and returned only with her daughter-in-law Ruth. Unlike Naomi, we should assume this woman didn't even have that much comfort. We don't read of any daughters or daughters-in-law. She was alone. Uh, Alfred Plummer, the biblical commentator, tells us that the mourning of a widow for an only son was <clears throat> the extremity of grief. This was about the worst thing that this woman could have gone through. And we read in the Easton Bible Dictionary this, the death of a widow's only son was the greatest mis misfortune conceivable because it left her absolutely alone. Now, the fact that there was a large crowd that was following her out of the city with the procession meant also that the city was moved by her loss. But the most important thing to see here, of course, is that Jesus was moved by this loss. When he saw her, his heart immediately went out to her. He felt compassion. Now, the word that, that uh, Luke uses uh, to describe this is essentially the same word that Jesus uses to describe what the Samaritan felt. When he came across the, the Jew that had been uh, basically beaten and uh, robbed and was left half dead by the side of the road, Jesus was moved with pity. He saw what she was going through and he entered into her sufferings. He, he felt for her. And he determined also that he was going to do something uh, about this. Now, we were reminded this morning, remember, that um, what Jesus says in, in John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, one of the expressions of love is, is compassion. It means to suffer along with someone else. And it's not that God necessarily suffers, but he was moved by his love because of our suffering to give what was most precious to him in order that he might save us from a most certain death. If God had not sent his son into the world, we all would have nothing to look forward to but an eternity of suffering. And Jesus came into the world uh, armed with the same compassion, moved by the same compassion to carry out the plan of God. And so what we see, of course, in our Lord Jesus is the compassion of God towards fallen man. And now he comes to this woman with the same compassion to relieve her suffering. First of all, he, he comes to her and he, he tells her that she should stop weeping. Uh, the reason why she should stop, of course, is not yet revealed to her, but it would be in a few moments. But the reason is, of course, because Jesus is going to put an end to it. He then put out his hand and he touched the coffin so that the procession stopped. Now, one thing that I think was interesting is that the coffin that this man was in was not the kind of coffin that we're used to today. It wasn't a box with a lid in which you would bury the body, but rather it was a, um, basically a stretcher or a plank of wood. I guess what you might see uh, people carrying uh, somebody who's wounded away from a scene of an accident uh, that was used to carry a corpse to the place in which that corpse would be buried. And I think that makes uh, more sense when you see, of course, uh, what happens next. After the procession comes to a halt, Jesus said, young man, I say to you, arise, get up. And he sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother, again showing us that Jesus is the one who has authority over death. And of course, by raising the son, puts an end to the woman's suffering. Now, when those who were following saw the dead man sit up, 
<laughs> they responded, I think, as we might very well today if we saw the same thing happen, although we are rather saturated by special effects, you know, today. But fear gripped them, which essentially means they were terrified by what they had seen. And they realized that God was present with them. They may not have fully understood that he was present in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, but they knew that he was working through the Lord Jesus, and they began giving glory to him, which means they were honoring God for this miracle they had seen because they realized God had sent a great prophet among them, like one of the prophets of, of the Old Testament, the one who was able to do great miracles. God was visiting them in his mercy, showing his compassion, particularly to this poor widow. And then, of course, they began to do what it is that the Lord intended, why he gathered such a large crowd around Jesus in the first place. They began telling everybody what they had seen. And it wasn't long before all Judea heard. And again, that's why the Lord reveals his mercy and his compassion to us, is so that we will tell others about what he has done for us. Now, I want us to notice a, a few things about this event. And the first one is the most obvious one, and that is that Jesus is able to do miracles, okay? He could do miracles. Miracles are not, you know, sleight of hand. They're not deceptions like uh, the magic that's done today. Miracles are supernatural events, things that happen that go basically against nature. They are above nature, uh, basically above the things that God has, has instituted in his creation, the way things normally work. There are things, of course, that don't happen every day. Uh, we, we see many examples in scripture, such as that of Hezekiah, when the shadows on his stairs moved in, in a direction other than the way they should have gone. Uh, when, they, uh, when they're steadily moving in one direction, we, of course, that's the norm, but when they go the other way, as they did in the case of Hezekiah, when he asked the Lord that the shadow would go up the steps rather than down so that he would know the Lord had heard and answered his prayer. That's a miracle when things go against nature. We know that when you take a loaf of bread and you begin breaking pieces off of it and you, you give it away to other people, the loaf gets smaller and eventually disappears and you don't end up with more bread left over than you begin with. And when you do end up with more bread, then that is a miracle, as our Lord Jesus fed 5,000 with a few loaves and fish. Jesus could do miracles. Jesus here raises a dead man to life. Now, the second thing is that miracles prove that the one who is doing the miracle was actually sent by God. That's, again, divine credentialing. That's how the Lord sets apart his, his messengers by allowing them to do these miracles. Now, it is true that there was such a thing as false signs and lying wonders when the devil would, would try to deceive God's people uh, into disobeying him by doing what appeared to be miracles. But they were false signs and they were lying wonders. They were not true miracles because the devil himself cannot override what it is that God has has really made a part of the fabric of his creation. God is, is working in the creation, making things work the way that they do. It's not that he isn't at work, but sometimes he alters the way that he works, and only God can do that. The devil cannot do that. Uh, so he can make something look miraculous by working behind the scenes and doing something that we cannot see, but he cannot overcome the laws of God. So then how, how could those who are looking at what looks like a miracle, how can they know what it is that they're looking at? Well, if the prophet who did the sign uh, spoke the truth of God, uh, he gave a sign or said what was going to happen and that thing came to pass and they would know that was a true prophet, whatever he said had to agree with the word of God. If he contradicted God's word, then he was a false prophet because God is always true to his word, and his messengers always speak the word of God. And that's the reason why we always need to compare what we see and what we hear with what God tells us. You know, it's interesting as I was going through the, uh, uh, the, some of the materials that are available, looking at apologetics, as I've told you before, and 
uh, Ken Ham, you know, who's talking about uh, the problems we, we face in America today. Why is it there are so few people that believe the truth? Why do they believe evolution and they don't believe the Bible? He says it's because, obviously, people do not respect the Bible. They do not read the Bible. And he says, same thing is true about those who are attending church. They're beginning to embrace things that are contrary to the Bible because they are not reading the Bible. This is where God has spoken. And really, he speaks in creation, but without a voice, he shows us many things about himself, not in a verbal way, but, but in, again, an evidential way, in a way that we can see. But he only speaks about his truth, about his ethics, about what he uh, is truly like. And, of course, the plan of salvation only in his word. We need to read his word. We need to compare everything we see with God's word. Now, thirdly, miracles were meant to stop traffic as well. You know, what, what um, the Lord allowed his messengers to do was, was usually not a small thing, but a very powerful thing, something that would uh, instill a certain kind of effect. Now, those who saw the shadows moving in the opposite direction and who saw the loaves of bread multiply and who saw storms and the waves cease or lepers cleansed or sicknesses you know, obviously healed, or someone who was dead sit up in their coffin or on their stretcher. When they saw that, it had a dramatic effect on them. It created fear. It created dread. It created terror. Those who saw what Jesus did were riveted by that very thing. They began to pay attention. You see, when God terrifies... Uh, we pay attention to him. Sometimes we don't in any other way. And that's the reason why Solomon writes this in Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's when you're afraid of him that you pay attention to him. Uh, and that's what brought us to him in the first place. And we still need a healthy fear of the Lord sometimes to listen to what he has to say when love is not strong enough to get us to go that direction. God is one not to be trifled with. We need to listen to him. As we were reminded this morning, if we don't fear the Lord, we will not listen to him. Now, the fourth thing is uh, coming back to what it is that Jesus did here. Jesus' miracles were always miracles of compassion. And I think that's something that uh, we need to pay attention to here. When Jesus wanted his audience to listen, he didn't cause earthquakes he didn't cause thunderstorms. He didn't make mountains move. He didn't open chasms under the feet to the point where people almost fell in. He didn't rain down fire from heaven. You know, that happened a lot in the Old Testament, and, and there was a reason for that, right? But rather, Jesus healed the sick. He opened the eyes of the blind. He made the lame to walk. He made the deaf to hear. He fed multitudes with bread, cast out demons, and raised the dead to life. And the reason was because this was the time of God's compassion. This was the time of his revealing his mercy. Not so much his justice as he did in the Old Testament. You know how the author to the Hebrews contrasts the Old Testament with the New Testament. He says, you know, you've not come to Mount Sinai and to this quaking mountain with fire and smoke and the sound of a voice that was so terrifying that Moses was shaking and begged that God would stop speaking. But you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to myriads of angels, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus Christ, the mediator of a new covenant. I like that picture a lot more uh, than the picture at Sinai. But that's the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant is the Lord is displaying his mercy. And by the way, God can do either and be perfectly just. But again, this is the time of his mercy. This is the time of that revelation, uh, of that love. God so loved the world. And that's why Jesus comes in his love and his mercy and his compassion in order to reveal that aspect of, of God. And, of course, that's what we are to be sharing with others during the time uh, of his grace, the time of his mercy. Today is the day of salvation. Today the offer is made. Today the door is open. And people can still come through it. They simply trust in him. But we also need to remember that the time of his justice is also coming. Just because God is showing his compassion and his mercy today does not mean he is not still a just God. And that's why the Lord wants us 
to warn them as well of what is coming, like a John the Baptist, flee from the wrath to come. So again, uh, the idea of these miracles is, is meant to instill fear in us so that we can pay attention to what God is saying and He is revealing to us now His mercy, but one day He will reveal that justice. But finally, and this is the main point I want us to see, is that the miracles that Jesus did, these miracles of compassion, in the, in the physical realm, the, these healings that He performed, were, were pictures of what He could do in the spiritual realm. When He made the blind to see, He was showing us that He could give us the ability to see the things that we can't see by nature. The Bible says we come into this world spiritually blind. We can't see the glory of God. Uh, people who, are, who don't have the Spirit of God read the Bible and they see it as a collection of myths and legends. They don't see anything special about it. They, all they see are contradictions. It's, you know, they don't see anything good in here and they try to discredit it. But those who have the Spirit of God read it and they see the glory of God. They hear the voice of God speaking uh, in the Word. He's the one who makes the blind to see. Uh, he's the one who makes the deaf to hear. When he made the deaf hear, he was showing us that he could also open our ears to hear and obey what it is that God says in his word. When he cleansed the lepers, he was showing us that he could take away the filth and the rottenness of our corruption and of our guilt. And when he raised the dead, he was showing us that he can raise dead souls to life. He can raise our souls to life, which is what gives us the blessing of spiritual sight and spiritual hearing and spiritual cleansing. When Jesus raised the widow's son, he essentially took that soul which had been separated from his body and he reunited them and made him alive again. The Bible says that when we die, our soul is separated from our bodies and it, of course, goes to one of two places. We're not actually told where this widow's son was. And I think for, for this particular sermon that may not be as important as the fact that Jesus had power to reunite them and to raise the dead. Only God can create that union and, and of course, only he can dissolve that union, but only he can bring it back together again. Uh, but when Jesus raises us spiritually, you know, he, in this case, is reuniting our souls with his Holy Spirit, okay? Now, we know from the Bible that God originally made us to be the temple of His Holy Spirit. He made us so that the Spirit of God would dwell in us, and that's the reason why when He created Adam, Adam was innocent, Adam was pure, Adam had the desire to love and obey God. We call that, basically, theologians call it original righteousness. It was the, the, principle, that, that, uh, the principle of the Holy Spirit in Him from which, basically, all of His good works came. It was a pure motive and a holy love for God. It was the presence of the Holy Spirit. But when Sat Adam sinned, he lost the Spirit. The Spirit departed. In this case, completely, not only uh, did Adam lose the Spirit, but he lost the Spirit for us as well. That's the reason why we come into the world spiritually dead and unable to do anything pleasing to the Lord. That's why by nature we, we are averse to the Bible and we're averse to church and to listening to sermons and being told about Jesus Christ. We don't like it. We want to get away from it. Well, that's because of what Adam did. But the second Adam, the Bible tells us, through his work, through his obedience, through his death, regained the Spirit of God that he might give the Spirit to whom he wills in order to make us alive. And that's what Jesus was referring to in our meditation when he says in John 5, 21, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom He wishes. And we shouldn't see this as two individuals acting independently, you know, the Father giving life to some and the Son giving life to some, but the Father through the Son giving life because they always act together. But the point is Jesus has the ability to give spiritual life. The reason why we're here this, this evening is because he has given to us spiritual life. That's the reason why we're trusting Jesus. That's the reason why we worship Jesus. It wasn't because, you know, we were 
more clever than others, that we were smarter than others, that uh, we were better than others. It's because the Father and the Son sent the Spirit to make us alive. You know, the Bible says that more often than not, the Lord actually saves and uses those who are, are small in the world's eyes in order that he might magnify his grace. Paul was basically uh, despised uh, by the Jews, by the world, but he was made mighty through God. And the Lord brought many people to Jesus through his testimony. Consider what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 through 31. He says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. Why are we in the Lord Jesus Christ? He goes on to answer, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, the work is entirely that of the Lord. It's not because we were so smart, we saw our need of Jesus, and we reached out to him. It was because God had mercy on us. Jesus alone can raise us from spiritual death to spiritual life. And that's what he was showing us through this resurrection of this young man. It was an act of compassion, you know, to give him back to this widow so that she would have a means of, of surviving. But it was also a picture of what he alone can do for us and that is raise us from death to life. Now we need to give him the glory then for our salvation. He alone get it, gets it. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord, not in yourself, but in him. And we also need to remember this when it comes to the salvation of others, to our family, our, our friends, and, and our neighbors. Um, they're not gonna find Jesus by themselves. They need two things. They need for us to bring the gospel to them, but they also need Jesus to call them. Jesus is, must raise them to life. Otherwise, they will remain dead. Basically, the, you know, the picture, think of the picture, you know, R.C. Sproul used the example of bringing a, a banquet, as it were, a, a, a meal out to a cemetery, and he says, you know, the man calls out and says, whoever wants this meal, let him get up and eat. Well, no one's going to get up and eat because they're all buried, they're all dead. It would be the same as Jesus speaking to the man on, or, you know, or anybody else really, speaking to the young man on the stretcher, get up. Uh, they don't have the ability to do it because they're dead. He must first of all give life before the person can respond, and that's what Jesus does. He gives that life, so we need to look to him, and we need to pray that he might grant that life to those who need it. They're not going to pray themselves. We need to pray for them, and we need to seek that the Lord might have mercy on them. Well, may the Lord, um, again, apply these things to us as we need to hear them this evening. Let, let's bow for a moment of, of silent prayer, and then I'll uh, close with, with prayer.